grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Dear Christian friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Dear friends, what would you say is the most painful experience of suffering that you have ever endured? A number of us have probably been through quite a few physical experiences of suffering, maybe multiple injuries as a result of some devastating accidents, some of which may have left you in chronic pain, or a sickness or the treatment thereof that continues to linger and cause pain, uh, maybe not in the past, but even still in the present. Maybe the most excruciating or painful experience of suffering that you've had isn't even physical. Maybe it's mental. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe it's a result of financial hardship or struggle that has weighed on you like nothing else. A relationship that has fallen apart, that has left you devastated or suffering. The sobering reality is that this topic of suffering is one that makes us mindful. The fact that we could share stories of experiences of suffering is the sobering reminder that we live in a broken and fallen world that is never going to be able to escape suffering. But this morning we're not just talking about suffering in general. We're giving our attention to a very specific type of suffering, a spiritual suffering, the kind of suffering that comes because of who we are in Christ. So how much have you suffered spiritually? Now, admittedly, uh, for better or worse, I would say that in the past, I have probably tended to diminish any sense of spiritual suffering that we have to face. Because the reality is that in our culture, in our world, when you compare what we have to deal with for our faith to other Christians who live elsewhere in the world, it just seems unfair to even try to make a comparison. Knowing that there are Christians who live in countries, who live in parts of the world where it's illegal to practice their Christian faith. Knowing that there are individuals that, that fear on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, as they gather for worship to put their faith into practice. They, they have very real threats that they are afraid of physical injury or even death itself. That just doesn't seem to, to give us a whole lot of room for comparison in the suffering that we face. And yet, we have to acknowledge that our connection to Jesus, our Christian faith, does result in spiritual suffering. We experience it in varying degrees. Maybe some of the relationships that I mentioned earlier have either become strained or estranged or have broken off completely because of different views of the Christian faith or because of somebody else falling away from the faith and not having the same respect or appreciation for you as they maybe once did. And though probably not too extreme, there are some workplace environments where, where we do face hostility or unique challenges because others know that we are, are Christians. And of course we all experience the weight, that, that sense of suffering in our culture as our society becomes increasingly godless and the things that are tolerated and then embraced, and then even celebrated, which we know to be sin, those things grieve us and, and weigh heavily on us to live in that world. And then that's not even getting to our own personal struggles, those seasons of struggle where we are tested mightily against sins that face us, sins that, sins that we fall flat on our face again and again, that we are enticed again and again, that, that maybe bring us to the brink of where Judas was, leading us to despair if we truly are forgiven, if salvation is really for somebody like me who keeps continuing to fall in that sin. So yes, there are different experiences that we have that make spiritual suffering very, very real. And those also then make somebody like John, the, the author of our words from Revelation this morning, very relatable to us. Because John knew what suffering was all about. John was not writing as some academic who, 
who read about it in a few books and is simply passing along to us some helpful information in the face of suffering, John was experiencing it himself. He was in exile, not because of murder, not because of insurrection, not because of genocide. He was exiled to an island because he was a Christian. And it was on that island that, that John wrote these words from Revelation. And he reminds us in, in verse 9, he tells us a little bit about himself. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Your, your brother and companion, John calls himself. Well, what is it that, that makes him our brother and companion? It's, it's that he is suffering for something that we can relate to to a degree because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. That was why he was there. Remember the time in which John lived, where Christian faith was being persecuted on multiple fronts. Remember somebody like Saul, not the, the first failed king of the Old Testament, not that Saul, but the Saul in the New Testament who was the persecutor and public enemy number one of the Christian church, who only by God's grace was converted to the very Christian faith he was determined to destroy. That Saul who now we know as the Apostle Paul. Do you think he was the only one? Surely there were many others, religious zealots uh, of other faiths that were trying to destroy and persecute Christians. To say nothing of that other front of the Roman government that didn't mince words or didn't shy away from persecuting Christians either. John is our brother and companion, familiar with suffering, somebody to whom we can relate. And it's John's words that are written to very real Christians experiencing real suffering in real congregations that he even listed for us, those cities where churches had been established. So where does John direct us? What is John's solution to those suffering spiritually? He says, look at the view. This last week, my family and I made it to Yosemite National Park for the first time. And, and it caught our attention once we're done with some of the windy roads as we made our way into the Yosemite Valley. When it's windy like that, you're looking to the left and to the right. And, and when we finally caught a glimpse of, of a waterfall off to our left, of course, we, we did what everybody does and pulled over and we all scampered out of the van and, and got closer to it. There was the ravine because the, the valley had started. And there on the other side was a beautiful beautiful waterfall. And I don't remember which of us recognized it first, but eventually, once we looked away from the waterfall and looked directly in front of us, our jaws dropped because we didn't even realize what we had missed. The first glimpse of one of the most majestic views in all of Yosemite, there was Half Dome right in front of us. Here we were focused on this waterfall, beautiful as it was, but we missed the bigger picture because of it. In the description that John gives us in these verses, the verses that follow where he's describing Jesus in very vivid, very picturesque imagery, it's easy for us to get caught up in each of these little details of how Jesus is described. And that's not to say they're, they're unimportant, but sometimes we make more of revelation than it, there needs to be. It's not that complicated. If you look at each of these phrases and descriptions, you can cross-reference them in the rest of the Bible and figure out pretty easily what the symbolism refers to. But what we don't want to do is miss the bigger picture. To look at the bigger view and see what John saw. Jesus, the resurrected, victorious Savior. Jesus, not the Good Friday Jesus, who in perfect humility allowed himself to be beaten and bruised, who allowed himself to be crucified. Not, not the Good Friday Jesus who appeared weak and spineless. No. He shows us a view of the Easter Sunday Jesus. The one who had risen in all of his glory and his power and his authority. That is the picture that John wants us to see in this vision that has been revealed to him. And when we see that picture, we are reminded of that victory that Jesus had over death and assured as well that his victory over sin, Satan, and even suffering means that we too are victorious over suffering. 
if we look at all of the little nuances of Jesus described in those verses, we can miss the bigger picture. Kind of like if you've gone through an art gallery and you see this, this beautiful work of art, maybe large enough to take up the better part of a wall. And there's so much to see, so much to look at, and your eyes are drawn to this little section and, and that color and this skill of the artist, and, and you get up closer. But if you don't take the time to step back and look at the big picture, look at the huge view in front of you, you miss the message that the artist was trying to convey. We don't want to miss that message that John is trying to convey to. Jesus lives. Jesus has risen. Jesus was victorious, and his victory, his, his winning means that we too have won. It had an impact on John. He shared exactly how he felt as he was given this vision of Jesus before him. In the first part of verse 17, he says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now remember, this isn't John in heaven. This is just a vision of John. So he saw this imagery of Jesus because if he was in heaven, there would be no fear. There would be no reason to be afraid of the risen, uh, of the resurrected Jesus. But this is a vision. And when you, if you could imagine right this very moment, seeing that same vision, that same imagery of Jesus, who of us would, would act any differently than to drop as if we were dead on the ground? But then John continues and gives us a comfort that we can only imagine he must have felt, must have swept over him. As verse 17 continues, Then he, Jesus, placed his right hand on me. Your God is a personal God. Yes, he loves the whole world, but he loves you as an individual. Can you imagine, in the face of this dread and this fear that John was feeling, to have his Savior reach out and with a gentle touch assure him, convince him that everything was okay. There was no more sin that separated them. There was no reason to be afraid of, of Jesus, and his gentle touch must have soothed and comforted him like nothing else. Your God is a personal God who cares about you personally. And then backs up that personal, gentle touch with these soothing words. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. As if Jesus is saying to John, John, you have nothing to be afraid of. I am is here. The first and the last. The one who always was and always will be. No one preceded me. No one will succeed me. And if Jesus is the first and the last, then he also will have the first and the last word. So that whatever Jesus promises is going to come true. Whatever Jesus says is going to happen. Whatever guarantees Jesus makes, you can take that to the bank. These are reliable, trustworthy words of Jesus the first and the last. And he goes on to describe himself. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. You notice how Jesus identifies himself. I am the living one. Not I was the living one, but now everything's changed. I am the living one. What I was was dead, but now I am living. As if now... Look at the view. Now I am living and will live forever. Death was not how Jesus identified himself. Death had been the character that played its role out in this story. And like some sitcom or some series that is streamed, it was a character that was killed off never to return again. Death served its role. It's done. And we don't need to fear it recurring anymore. Because Jesus has defeated it. Jesus has overcome it. He is the living one. And he's the living one who holds the keys. Keys are a symbol of power, of authority. If you hold the key, then, then you have the power to open or close. You have the power to grant or deny access. 
You can determine who is going to be allowed, who's going to be permitted, and, and who will not. You have all of the power if you hold the keys. And not just any keys, but as Jesus says, the keys to death and Hades. All of us have, have been or experienced a, a time where we don't know where our keys are. You've lost your keys. And, and the minute you realize that when you reach for them in your pocket or your purse, you're flooded with this sense of, of overwhelm, of anxiety, not knowing where they are immediately, and you would fear the worst, you assume the worst, and then you slowly play out in your mind all of the places that you were, the, the spaces that you might have set them down, thinking ahead of time, trying to retrace your steps. And as you are going through those anxious steps, trying to, to find your keys, then it occurs to you to ask either a spouse, a friend, a child, has anybody seen my keys? And just as suddenly as you were overwhelmed with that feeling of anxiety of not knowing where your keys are, suddenly a calm peace rushes over you when you hear from somebody else, oh, I've got them, I've got them right here. Here are your keys. Now imagine that. Not your spouse, not your child, not a friend, not somebody else other than Jesus saying, I have the keys. And what keys does he have? The keys to death and Hades. The keys to life and death, the keys to heaven and hell. He is the one who determines our eternity. And his victory over death and over Satan. And the assurance that he gives to John and to us this morning guarantees us exactly how he wants to comfort us with the assurance that he has the power of those keys. So now, dear friends, let's revisit this matter of spiritual suffering that we face. No matter the degree, it looks a little bit different. It's a different conversation in light of where John has directed our attention this morning. No, none of us is going to, to walk out of here with this fairy tale idea that, that some magic wand can be waved and no more suffering is ever going to be a part of our lives or a concern for any of us. We know better. We know better because Jesus has promised that would not be the case. He said to expect suffering for his sake while we are here on earth. But brothers and sisters in Christ, overshadowing that promise of suffering is the promise of Jesus' victory over suffering. Jesus' victory over death. Jesus' victory over your sin. That he says is, is your victory as well. That he promises to you and to me it is something that is going to carry us and far outshine any of the suffering of this world. So what difference does Jesus' resurrection make? What, what difference does last Sunday make for, for us this week and next week and for the years that we remain here on this earth? Well, depends on what you're going to focus on. Focus your attention on your suffering. Be consumed by it. Dwell on it. Look only at that, and it will consume you. But you will embrace the victory that you have in Christ when you follow in John's footsteps as we have this morning. Who directed us not to look at your suffering and your hardship and your toil and your challenges, but instead said, look at the view. Look at your risen Savior in all of his glory, risen, resurrected, who will return on that last day. And with that confidence, we can bear up under any suffering. And we look to the Savior and not our suffering. We see how small our suffering truly is. Because the worst of your suffering is only going to be temporary. It's only going to be limited, confined to this world. But your joy in Jesus and his resurrection, that, dear friends, is eternal. That is forever. Jesus' victory over Satan, his victory over sin, and his victory over suffering guarantee it. And they guarantee that you, too, will remain victorious over suffering. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.